I will now welcome back to stage um, my colleague, Will Worley. Thank you very much, Kate. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for sticking around. And do feel free to stick around a little bit longer for the cocktail reception later on. So a lot of the talks we've been having today have centered more or less around climate adaptation issues, a lot of it. But for the world to stand a fighting chance on 1.5, it is crucial to decarbonize emerging economies. And so climate justice and energy transitions is where adaptation and mitigation is sort of meet. How can emerging economies switch to renewables while, while preserving the livelihoods of people working in fossil fuel industries in, and the communities depending on them? One response to this has been the Just Energy Transitions Partnerships, the JETPs, a groundbreaking model attempted in South Africa, which has also been touted as a potential model for other countries to follow. To discuss that with us today, Dennis Manelli has joined us very kindly from the Presidential Climate Finance Task Team of South Africa. But this model is, needs to be applied to, these sorts of models need to be applied to other parts of the world. So to discuss uh, scaling these in other parts of the, the world, Glenn pierce Ross is joining us from uh, SE for All, where he's Senior Director of International Relations and Special Project. Nick Hardman Mountford is joining us from the Head of Oceans and National Resources at the Commonwealth Secretariat. And we're very lucky to have with us as our last minute guest, Minister for the Environment and Climate Change in Somalia, Khadija al Makuzi. So thank you very much for joining us. If you'd like to come and join me on stage. Thank you all so much for joining us. There we go. Dennis, if I could, uh, if I could start with you. Could you give us uh, your reflections, Dennis, on uh, the jet fees process in South Africa and an update on the latest, if you would? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon <clears throat> to everyone. And um, uh, thanks for the opportunity to participate in, in this panel. And, and share our experiences in terms of the, this JetP process. Um, clearly, we are very proud to have reached this very significant milestone of being able to release the investment plan, uh, which was released in South Africa on, on Friday and officially handed over to our IPG <clears throat> partners um, on Monday. Um, and obviously, not just the plan as such, but attached to that as well. Um, yesterday, the first sort of tangible implementation steps, because I think that's one of the issues that uh, people have talked about and say, look, it's time that we move beyond undertakings, uh, promises, ambitions to actual uh, action. So that was in the form of uh, two loans that form part of the financing package uh, being being signed in terms of the loan agreements, uh, which would lead to uh, disbursements of funds uh, early next year. So there's actual implementation steps uh, that are happening already. Um, others um, need to follow, and these are rate, uh, loans at, at highly concessional rates. Um, we made very good progress in terms of what was announced at COP last year. Uh, it seems a long time ago, but if one consider the, the complexity and the intricate nature of what needed to be accomplished, I think uh, this is indeed a milestone for us to have been able to deliver what we promised by way of being able to show substantive progress by the time of, of this COP. So the investment plan that we, we produced to underpin this Just Energy Transition Partnership takes a, an integrated and, and holistic approach, uh, which speaks to, of course, addressing climate uh, change risks, uh, delivering to our 
international commitments in terms of what was deposited as our nationally determined contribution, but it also seeks to make sure that as we do that, we align with other outcomes uh, that are important to South Africa, social, economic, and governance, and make sure that in the process also we address uh, a growth and, and, and develop initiatives. So it is a plan that was developed through a, a country-owned, a country-led uh, process and a country-specific process that made sure um, that South Africa's ambitions and priorities are, are considered and, um, and, and so from that perspective uh, that's partly part of the lessons and reflections very very important that the process is country owned and country led um, it has of course as a central feature uh, the justice element so the just uh, transitioning of our energy system uh, which pervades the entire plan so when you look at the three priority areas that were identified in terms of decarbonized electricity sector, uh, looking at new energy vehicles and, and, and green hydrogen, this just component is woven through the entire uh, uh, program and, and, and the, the investments that need uh, are, are required, in addition to sort of two cross-cutting investments that have to do with, uh, with jobs uh, <clears throat> as um, sort of skills uh, building and, and, and reskilling and uh, capacitation of, uh, of local governments to be able to, to implement. Um, in terms of how we went about it from a prioritization uh, perspective, we were very clear at the beginning that we needed to have certain principles that would inform which programs, which projects, which portfolios would be considered for uh, this program, which um, as many of you would have seen is about 1.5 trillion uh, rands over five years, about $85 billion. So the key issue was, of course, those projects and those portfolios needed to uh, contribute to greenhouse gas emissions so that we get into NDC targets. They needed to deliver these just outcomes and, and they needed to be catalytic in the sense that they help uh, set the stage for other further invest investments that need to happen and are cross-cutting in terms of industries in nature. And of course, they needed to be ready to be, to be implemented. One of the key issues also that was very important at the outset was to define certain guiding principles, financing guiding principles that would underpin the package uh, to support this plan and the financing package. One, uh, was to make sure that we keep to the the UN FCCC principles that obviously require us to hold developed uh, nations uh, accountable for supporting developing nations in their in their transition. That those uh, uh, commitments are adhered to. The second one was the con uh, principle of. of additionality that we make sure that there is a substantive portion of this is fresh money as opposed to a recycling effort of some sort. Um, again, that just the just components in terms of investments and financing as mainstreamed. Uh, the other issue, of course, uh, in terms of country specific that I spoke to, was to make sure that in designing this package, we take into account this country specific circumstances around fiscal realities of South Africa, that we make sure that in trying to solve one problem around climate risk and climate change, we don't inadvertently cause another one by loading up on climate-related debt. And that also speaks to the, um, the cost and the finding of that debt. We need to make sure that there is a high level of concessionality uh, to the funding and um, and, and, and sort of a, a, a yardstick to that effect was that these funds need to be uh, obviously at rates that are more competitive uh, than than market that we could go and raise on, on, on our own. Um, the other issue, of course, was that the flows uh, needed to be certain and, and predictable so that we can sustain a, um, an investment plan. And last but certainly not least, the principle that says even the eight and a half billion dollars that 
our partner countries have committed to mobilize is a very small amount relative to the scale of need so that the last principle was very, very important to say that how do we deploy these funds in such a manner that we leverage and, and, and manage to crowd in the much bigger pools that sit in the uh, in the domestic and in the in the international um, uh, uh, private markets. So um, yeah, in terms of lessons learned, just very briefly, I think again this country owned and country led process I can't emphasize enough. Um, the other issue is to set up uh, a governance structure early on, clear allocation of responsibilities, strong uh, a program lead. Um, making sure that um, there is robust engagement, very critical to make sure that some of the issues that are critical, uh, one deals with upfront. You don't avoid the difficult questions upfront, uh, rushing to make announcements uh, and, and those type of things, uh, because that uh, links to another uh, lesson, I would say, around expectations management. We found that uh, by the time we got to February, March, April last year, people in South Africa were asking, already, when's this money coming? Uh, and, and obviously, it's very, very important that there is information flow and explanation just around what is involved, how complex these issues, when one can expect uh, the flows uh, to register. And um, yeah, I would think that would be, for me, the, uh, the, the key lessons. Uh, in terms of what what we learned, but a, a very sort of engaged process, uh, culminating in, in this plan um, that that we've we, we, we've put out. I mean, maybe finally, I guess it goes without saying, is that given how far-reaching uh, a nature of decisions one is taking, I remember even in our plan is just for the first five years. These are the initial five years. But the transition journey overall is a multi-decade journey which requires even more uh, funding. And you can see easily this kind of process straddling various policy areas. Obviously, energy policy to start with environmental policy. This can morph into trade policy, into industrial policy, the social labor policies, a fiscal, as I've mentioned now given that it all comes down to money and available resources. So important that this process is accompanied by a robust but controlled um, consultation and, 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 and participatory process. So we went through and engaged quite broadly youth, uh, business, labor, uh, faith-based organizations, uh, local authorities, um, so that was quite important to do that. And, and as part of implementation, that is also going to be the hallmark of continuing okay. uh, to involve people. Thank you so much. That's been a really fascinating insight into what has been an extremely complex but important process. Now, Glenn, most of your career has been focused on looking at the equitability of energy transitions. Can you just give us some of your reflections on what Dennis has just told us? So I think the, thank you, Thanks very much, Will. I, I think the experience of South Africa uh, is an experience worth understanding to learn from. Uh, and part of that learning has to do with recognizing what the situation is in terms of energy in Africa. And this is why uh, Sustainable Energy for All has been supporting spaces where African governments can start to collectively articulate what their vision for a just and equitable energy transition should look like. Because the just energy transition that we've been discussing at a global level since 2015 is very appropriate for industrialized countries that only have to shift from one source to another. In African countries and other developing countries, there are many other issues that have to be addressed, including universal access to energy, which, as a reminder, is electrification as well as clean cooking. And so until and unless there's universal access to energy, what are we transitioning towards? 
This has to be part of the just and equitable energy transition in Africa because it needs to address that inequality that continues to exist. It needs to also recognize the importance of industrialization processes that many African countries are still interested in pursuing. It also needs to address uh, different issues in terms of local supply chains for many of the much of the manufacturing that needs to take place if there's interest in moving towards an, a, a renewable energy pathway. And so I would submit that the just and equitable energy transition is very much possible, but it needs to be defined, and this is where I'm, 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 I'm taking from uh, our colleague from South Africa's uh, idea of it has to be defined by African countries. And once that definition is found, then there has to be a credible response from the global community. And this, this is where I, there may be some daylight in, in the way I've watched the JETP evolve in the sense that that credible response cannot take 13, 14, 15 months, as you re re reflected at the end. That credible response needs to happen quickly for that these transition pathways, so that these transition pathways can move forward in different African countries. I think it's, it, it's really brilliant to, to weigh the, the experience of South Africa with, with Somalia, because Somalia clearly has a, a large access challenge that it still needs to deal with. But Somalia is not alone. Uh, we know that roughly uh, 48 to 50 percent of Africans still do not have access uh, to electrification, uh, and 2.9 billion people globally do not have access to clean cooking. Uh, so these are issues that need to be addressed as part of this transition in these countries. Minister, thank you for that, Glenn. Minister, can you give us your perspectives then from Somalia and the challenges around energy access, please? Hi, thank you so much. Um, Yes, I mean, Somalia have a biggest challenge about the climate change. As the Somalian is the first time having a Minister of Environment and Climate Change and almost been nominated in three months. So this is the first time. And the reason that uh, Somalia felt the heat of the climate change that we're going through in Horn of Africa um, is the only country, if I go back uh, to give brief about the climate change, and Somalia is the only country that have a problem with the flood and the drought in the same time. So this is the main problem that we always get. The other we get the flood or the droughts. And Somalia depends on the agricultural side of the uh, rain. So if I come back with your uh, the subject, Somalia used the uh, charcoal to cook for most of the houses and uh, cutting the tree. So uh, we don't have uh, clean cooking. So um, to have that, to able to start, Somalian is the is African horn of Africa. We could able to have the solution of having electricity and either solar or wind. So I think this is the best solution for Africa could able to have the solar and the wind, and to fight with the the climate change to stop the having to have the people able to have the clean cooking. So this is a university that needs to able to find the solution for Africa. And this is the, the solution that we need for Africa, especially in Somalia, that we cannot able to stop cutting the tree and making a charcoal. And this is already, if we able to start the government working on it, what's the solution? If we able to stop the people cutting the trees and able to go and uh, stop the charcoal and go to clean and uh, cooking, how they cook. So we need to have opposite other way around uh, what can they able to offer for the people to able to use so this is the challenge that at the, at the moment that we have and we looking for digging down to find a solution and the biggest solution is the energy renewable energy that we have with suffering thank you fantastic minister thank you and like clean cooking of course not just a, a problem in, in so well, the lack of clean cooking is not just a problem in Somalia but in many parts of Africa and, and the broader world Coming to the broader world, Nick, the Commonwealth spans dozens of countries. Could you perhaps give me some of the perspective the Commonwealth has on, on the just transitions process? 
Yeah, thanks, Will. Um, and um, we, we, the Commonwealth is 56 countries um, across um, the, all, all the regions of, of the globe, um, two and a half billion people, about a third of the world's population, um, and 60% of them under the age of 30, which is really important when we, we think about this question about, you know, the, the, the youth uh, of today are the ones who have to live with this change. So, so this is, you know, and, and they're the ones going to be continuing what we start here. And I want to focus on this, this question, you know, you were raising about, about the just transition, you know, and, and, and this is about equity and it's about fairness. And I have to say again, you know, that, that the um, developing countries are contributing less than 7% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but they've been disproportionately affected and are on the front lines of the climate change crisis at the moment. So, so this is already not fair. And that has to underpin everything we think about when we think about this crisis. And then when we look at energy access and this energy access gap that's been highlighted so well by our speakers so far, it, it, again, that, that, that is the equity component. We really have to address this. Um, Bloomberg New Energy Finance yesterday launched their scaling um, the, the energy gap in Africa report. And, and, and you know, it really sort of highlights some very strong figures for Africa across the broader world, you know, there's seven, nearly 760 million people um, without access to any electricity. Um, it, it, with, that's just in the Commonwealth. You know, globally, there's m many more. Um, globally, there's 2.6 billion people. That's like the whole population of the Commonwealth, a third of the world's population don't have access to any clean f fuels for cooking. This is the scale of the problem. So, so this isn't a little pocket of investment we need to just make, to, to, to solve a, a little problem. This is a third of the world's population. Um, so as you were saying, you know, the investment required for this is huge. Um, and it has to be equitable. It has to be um, affordable. Um, to, to address the challenge. So, but it, but it is tractable because 80% of this gap is made up by 20 countries, again, 10 of which are in the Commonwealth. So, so, so when we think about it that way, we can target um, those countries and really help to, to, to break the back of this inequity. Um, so from the Commonwealth perspective, this is something that's been on, on heads of government's agenda for a while. In 2018, they raised it strongly in the heads of government meeting in London. On the back of that, we brought countries together in 2019 around the Commonwealth Sustainable Energy Forum um, to really st get them to share their, their views, their voices, um, and, and gain common understanding from each other. And that was, that was a, actually a magical experience, really having that rich conversation between countries. And on the back of it, they, they asked us to form what we've called the Commonwealth Sustainable Energy Transition Agenda, which is a platform for countries to come together regularly to share these experiences. Um, we've um, got three pillars, um, one around the inclusive energy transitions, one about around technology and innovation, and one around enabling frameworks. And um, then countries are now forming um, action groups on priority topics they've identified. So Kenya's championing geothermal energy. We have um, an energy literacy action group um, which is really trying to trying to ensure that the energy is taught in schools and really, you know, uh, the next generation understands energy. Um, and Iswatini are championing that, and we have a youth action group as well, which is cross cutting. So, so, so these things are, are, are you know really bringing countries together to learn from each other, look for solutions together, and move forward. Um, we talked about about sort of the the, the uh, challenges for, for petroleum producers and um, uh, oil and gas producers a little bit, and I think this is is a really what, important one to raise as well because a lot of countries have come to this quite late. Um, they're, they're new petroleum producers; they are relying on these um, revenues for their sustainable development, but they are now trapped um, with challenges um, around. Um, 
growth opportunities around sort of the, the uncertainties for their economies, heavy, um, you know, future consumption trends, global investment flows, technology advancements, energy choices, all these things play out. Uh, they, they've got the risk of stranded assets. Um, and so um, helping countries to, to understand the choices they've got to make, um, to understand where the investment flows are going, to um, enable the energy transition um, is absolutely critical for these countries to be able to see a sustainable de development pathway um, that that allows them to not feel they've been um, they've had to give up on on these resources they have that could really power the f that, that they thought would power the future. So. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Any final thoughts, Dennis, on the recapping on what everyone's just said now and how it relates to the South African experience? I think the one thing, sorry, the one thing I just wanted to add, which I forgot earlier on, just in terms of criticality of, you know, being able to succeed with these things, the, the enabling policy uh, framework that needs to be in place. So that's very, very critical that as and when one implements and one transitions, you make sure that your policy environment is fit for purpose and moves uh, uh, with uh, with the time. Um, but I'd, I'd fully align with the with the comments that have been made here in terms of uh, the critical uh, role that we we need to play and and just emphasise uh, the issue that for countries to be able to successfully meet the decarbonization targets and transition successfully taking into account the just component and making sure that those that are most affected uh, by the transition because of the high level of dependency on the fossil fuel value chain uh, are, are are sufficiently protected and and that that is simply a function of the financial resources that are available so significant amounts of funds um, need to be mobilized still to make sure that uh, we can meet this challenge. Once again, the importance of finance has been raised, a thread that is running right through this COP. I'd like to, sorry, I haven't got time, Nick. I apologize. I've got to say thank you very much to our panel for being here. Um, can you, you are staying on stage. The rest of us, if you'd uh, like to follow me up. And I will welcome onto stage my colleague uh, in Nairobi, Sarah Jerving. Thank you.